probably one of my favourite spots, which I've had a, probably 10 years involvement with, is Long Swamp in Discovery Bay Coastal Park. I take a few photos and, and these are all mine ex except for one. Probably the most important site in Victoria for this maroon leek orchid, which is also over there on the picture over there. And its habitat's really that, that calcareous sedge land, which is now considered an endangered vegetation type. So it's probably one of the sort of very high proportion of sedges, very sort of shallow soils and a really unique vegetation type that's not really known from uh, many other areas. I think in, over in East Gippsland there might be something a little bit similar, um, but the majority of it's in that map that we've been looking at, uh, Long Swamp area. So yeah, back to 2008 it was, um, yeah, 10 years ago thereabouts. Uh, my first involvement was my, I think it was my first week, I used to work with uh, with DELP uh, doing some threatened species work and majority of that was uh, working with plants and um, this is one of our target species. So back then we sort of, we assumed there was only 10 or so plants from a small area sort of close to the track here, but that's because that was the area where most people looked. So we had, oh, I think it was about 15 very enthusiastic volunteers that were orchid nuts. I didn't know a lot about orchids, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot in that two days that we, we sort of spent walking around here. So we surveyed for, we are basically looking for the uh, maroon leek orchid. So yeah, we ended up over that two days, we, over a weekend, um, we ended up finding, I think it was like 650 or something sort of scattered throughout that. So they're all the blue dots. Yeah, we also found a few other species, the swamp greenhood, um, which is also nationally endangered and a little helmet orchid as well. So the target was very much about orchids. We come across this um, black and white tiger moth larvae, caterpillar, which I don't know if you know, it's like a, it's a black, black and white moth, quite small, uh, but the caterpillar is very distinctive. And nearly every, every time we come across a population of plants, it'd be, yeah, two or three of these fat, hungry caterpillars munching on these uh, critically endangered plants. So, um, I haven't seen them out there again since, but I don't know why that, that year there were just, yeah, a lot of, the, a lot of the plants were getting, and it's really just gone up the spike um, with the flower over there and just chewing off each, each flower and moving on to the next plant. So that was quite interesting, but probably the, one of the more exciting finds of the day, one of the volunteers said, oh, uh, come over here and check out this little green damselfly. Uh, it's, yeah, and so we all walked over there and one of the guys, uh, Reiner, who also took this photo on the right, goes, oh, I reckon that might be the ancient greenling. So um, we looked into it and, and got it checked out. And yeah, sure enough, it was presumed extinct uh, for, a num for a number of years um, until rediscovered on that, that survey in 2008. So uh, yeah, its history is pretty interesting. It was first recorded um, through fossils and identified as, it, as a as a, a, I guess, an ancient form of damsel fly that was once common. So when this was first, the living specimen was found, they decided that this is the closest relic to that prehistoric damsel fly. So hence the name ancient greenling. So yeah, we found quite a good population of them and it really sort of set um, a, internationally sort of uh, a lot of the uh, invertebrate specialists and, and damsel fly experts come here from all over the world to check it out. So not long after this, a few years ago, this ladybird, I'll, I'll try and uh, flatten you with my, my pronunciation, uh, my capris, that's not quite it, but uh, so yeah, it was also found out there and it was uh, last seen in 1940 and presumed extinct as well. So um, it's in the sort of, there's a little swamp, I actually haven't seen it, but um, Millhouse Road, part of Long Swamp there, so it's only known from that one site now too, and I think, uh, um, so if you've seen that around, you're probably one of only two people who have seen that in the last 80 years, so small population, um, yeah, and it's really exciting that, that now we, 100% of the known sites for this little ladybird is in Discovery Bay Coastal Park, so also found by the same guy, he knows his stuff. So getting out of the swamp into a bit more of the terrestrial environment. Earlier on, come across a really nice area, which is sort of south of Browns Road, which if you're looking at Discovery Bay, you've got sort of these open sand dunes and then they stop 
and then it gets into more vegetated uh, area further to the to the west. So this is kind of like that transition between the open sand dunes and and the heavier before we get to the swampy country. Yeah, it's about nine hectares of this sort of undulating limestone outcrops, which look quite interesting. When I first went there in, I think it was in 2009, it was sort of covered in pine trees and coastal wattle. And I spent, yeah, quite a bit of time out there just looking around and checking out plants because, because I've always liked plants. Uh, and uh, yeah, over, over the years we've, well, I started off doing it sort of in my own time, going out and killing a few pine trees and the beauty of uh, things like the recognition of Ramsar have sort of enabled me to really sort of uh, tap into some of the resources that the, the CMA have got through, through this. And also, um, uh, also through uh, other work that I've done with DELP um, through state government funds, we've been able to do some really good work. So on that little nine hectare limestone outcrop ridge, there's a, there's a heap of species, uh, mostly plants that are really unique and um, uh, aren't found many where else in Victoria. Or, or have a really bizarre geographic range. So um, this one here was the first time this was found in Victoria. Uh, yeah, stumbled across this little spider orchid. It's about this tall, so it's quite, quite small. This little one in the corner here. So um, the limestone spider orchid, it was called. However, that name was already taken in Victoria, so we had to give it a new name. The one I proposed didn't get up. So I think it's called the limestone ridge spider orchid now. Um, but yeah, it's, it's couple of hundred plants and only really known for that one site in Victoria. It's rare in South Australia, but it also occurs in, in Western Australia. So it's one of those um, to be expected sort of geographical range extensions. Um, this little guy here is the Mallee fringe lily. Lila Hubina, who you probably all have known or, or heard of, uh, said to me one day back in, I think it was 2014, she said, oh, I've, I found this really bizarre, um, Fringe lily, well, I'd love for you to come see it. So we walked out there to, uh, it was Livingston Island. And she was, I was here a few hours ago, she said, and it was just here, but it was gone. So um, it was funny, a few weeks later, I was, I was out here and I saw this little fringe lily and I thought, hang on a minute, I, I reckon that's the same one that Lila was talking about. And, and I, I went back there and I couldn't find it. Um, so I took this photo this week when I was out there on a warm sunny day. This, this is the Mallee fringe lily. So it's known distribution in Victoria is really up around sort of right up in the Mallee, sort of near Hope Dern and Oyun and those sort of areas growing in, in desert sands. Um, but yeah, obviously this, this sort of it easily overlooked. Um, when it's not in flower, you probably won't see it, but um, there's a good little sort of population of these little Mallee fringe lilies occurring on this limestone ridge. Uh, and yeah, um, quite an attractive little thing too. And, it's got these really large tubers, um, probably you know, almost the size of a tennis ball. So would have been certainly an important plant, I would have thought, at one once upon a time. So moving on to our right is the coastal leek orchid, which is endemic to the Discovery Bay Coastal Park, extinct in South Australia. There are some good numbers, but it, it has also been nominated as a uh, federally endangered plant, and I think that's been accepted. So. Still waiting on the department to, um, to announce that. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's a really important plant too and, and one that, um, yeah, it's really critical that uh, Discovery Bay sort of manage for, for these important species. I took this photo last week because um, through uh, the, the CMA uh, and conservation volunteers, we've had these uh, Californian Conservation Corps people out there in, in this particular spot I'm still talking about. Uh, helping out with some weed control and yeah for me I you know being a being a ranger and have, there's not many of us really and and we have a you know a large area to look after and a, a lot of responsibilities it's really important we tap into resources like this and um, to have uh, it was 10 really enthusiastic young people that that you know were interested in in helping out um, they really did the job of what I could do in it would take me a lot longer to do it. Yeah, like, I mean, they were just lots of energy and uh, yeah, did a lot of weeding, hand pulling. Um, they were very, very fit and um, very, very committed. So, um, which is really good. So yeah, they were helping out this week out there, which is fantastic. 
I'm also involved in, in another program a little bit further to the north on the stones. I got some funding a couple of years ago to, to do some goat control because it's, it's uh, something that uh, we've identified as an important thing in our, in our management plan for the area uh, up at Mount Napier. So uh, it's really, yeah, for me I've always been interested in plants and have a, you know, a really sort of do a lot of weed control and, and uh, to take on, I've done a little bit of work with um, foxes and that sort of stuff, but goat control is something that was new to me, so I've been learning a fair bit about it. So uh, Mount Napier State Park just near Hamilton, um, it's probably at the northern and uh, easternmost extent of our area that we look after. Um, Tapok, beautiful uh, old volcano, it's got uh, some of the best representations of scoria cone, wood, cone woodland in left in, in Victoria, which is a isolated um, vegetation type that always occurs on, on old volcanoes. Yeah, and it's also got some um, caves down this way with some really rare fern communities that, that the goats have been um, yeah, problematic in sort of browsing on them and, and, and doing what goats do best and that's eating things. So uh, yeah, this week we've um, yeah, managed to release uh, eight goats with collars on them, so Judas goats, to give us a bit of an idea of, of where they're, they're moving. But yeah, I mean, it's a really challenging landscape with all the rocks and uh, not many tracks and uh, also land, uh, adjoining landholders and, and poor fencing in terms of uh, mostly the old dry stone walls and which, which a goat can just hurtle over with ease. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's something that also I'm working on, but um, in addition to that, there's also yeah, lots of other things happening in the environmental space that I sort of try to keep across. But as you can appreciate, it's a, it's a big area and uh, we try to do our best. Goats have been in this landscape here at Mount Napier for, for a long time, probably 30 years or so. Um, and I suppose it's an emerging species that's popping up in the Kabobany and, and also in the Lower Glenelg National Park that we're we don't see as often, and, and also at Budge Bim as well, which is, which is a, of concern. And along with goats, pigs, deer, um, they're all sort of uh, exotic yeah, fauna that are yeah, not necessarily the best for our environment, and um, something as, as land managers is probably going to be a little bit more funding driven towards that, because you can probably yeah, have a lot of benefits um, with, with controlling pest species. So yeah, I think probably the benefit out of this is, is me getting my head around sort of the process of, uh, yeah, goat control and uh, for us to be able to sort of apply what we learn at these other sites at places like Inkpot and, and the Kabobanis. The Budgeman Rangers has kindly helped me install some uh, monitoring, camera monitoring, and here's a, not a very great photo of a wedge-tailed eagle hunting down a little baby goat. So we've found some solutions to some of the problems and I suppose it's yeah good to have help from others and to be able to do the best we can with with yeah everyone that wants to be involved and, and who can be so thanks very much. Thank